welcome to Bad Ideas, the show where we look at misfires, mistakes, and miscalculations from all throughout history. I'm Tony Southcott. And I'm Albert Berg, and today's episode is brought to you by our featured patron, Zoli. Thank you, Zoli. Hey, Zoli. It's a Zoli day. Tony is delivering our bad idea for this week. Tony, what do you got? We're going to be talking about the movie Roar. It's a 1981 movie that took 11 years to make, and without hyperbole, is the most dangerous Hollywood film ever made. Wow. Wow. Not the greatest title, I want to point out. It's better than the title they originally had for it. Was it, like, was that their original title, or? It was Lions, Lions, and More Lions, which actually is probably pretty accurate. (laughs) No, no, I have to disagree with you. That's not better. Why aren't we talking about Lions, Lions, and More Lions? Maybe that's why they couldn't find some of the distribution they needed later. This movie... It's not, like, whenever you hear dangerous in Hollywood, most often that means that it's, like, some sort of, like, dramatic storytelling or it's something going against the norm. But no, this is literally a movie that was the most dangerous to make because there was 150 lions, tigers, cheetahs, and other giant cats used in the making of it, along with elephants, floods, fires, financial disasters, and you have a film that hospitalized more than 70 crew members and scarred many, many more than that. More than 100 people ended up getting like full-on slashed or injured during the making of this movie. 70 crew members. 70 That's crew members. A lot. And keep in mind that the hospital is 45 minutes away, so they tried to t- take care of it as much as they could on site. I've got to say, if you're going to make a lion if you're going to make a movie called Lions, Lions and More Lions, 150 150- I'm going to give you that one. That is a good number of lions. (laughs) As with many bad ideas, the film started with good intentions. It was planned to be a way to spread the word about animal conservation in Africa. Noel Marshall, who would act, direct, and train the animals for this film, fell in love with big cats when he and his wife, Tippi Hedren, did some work in Africa in 1969. While making the movie Satan's Harvest, they took some time to explore Africa. On their adventure, they found a plantation house that had been taken completely over by a pride of lions and this would ultimately inspire it i gotta say just hearing that what you just said there that does sound like something from a movie going into sort of a ruined house right like there's vines creeping up the sides and then like probably the roof is kind of busted in so you're having shafts of sunlight coming in through into the atrium and then there's just some lions sitting around on the On the steps. That's so Hollywood. It's so instantly cinematic. I think, like, if I saw that thing, that would have been my thought, too. So, like, you could easily see why some creative people do this. By the way, I don't know how many people still know who Tippi Hedren is. Tippi Hedren was the star of The Birds. She was in a lot of other Hitchcock movies. She did a lot of work over her career. Uh, She's still around. She is the mother of uh, Melanie Griffith, uh, who is the mother of Dakota Johnson, who is currently in the new Suspiria and Fifty Shades and all that other stuff. So there's uh, there's some connections to modern Hollywood here, too. I heard the name and I did. It sent off like I should know who that person is, but I couldn't connect it to the birds, Tony. Not that oh. smart. Well, I also ha- did a five facts on the birds, so I had to read a lot about her in a different movie that I ended up doing. Originally, Hedren and Marshall spoke to some trainers on how to do a movie like this and how to train these lions. They wanted to get 25 lions total so that they could make some really cool epic shots. And the trainers basically told them that this is an awful idea, and the only way that you could do it is if you actually raised the lions from birth. Wait, 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 wait. So they're like, we need 25 lions in our movie. How would we train them to do that? And the trainers are like, it's literally impossible. Don't try. And they're like, Cool, we're going to go get 150 lions. (laughs) They didn't say impossible, they just said it would be incredibly stupid. Well, (laughs) okay. Yes. But Technically, hurling yourself over the lip of the Grand Canyon is not impossible, but it does end with you dead. Very true. (laughs) Instead of giving up on this idea, Noel Marshall found an exotic animals magazine and ordered a lion cub. What There's year a, is this happening in? Uh, this was nineteen sixty nine. They're just they've just got like oh man, get your copy of Exotic Animals Weekly. 
and then like you flip to the back and it's like, did you want a lion cub order now? <laughs> I mean, you got to remember that they're 99 plus shipping and handling. Yeah. I, I have no idea how much these sorts of things would cost, but you got to remember that this is a thing that still happens all the time. There are more live lions in Texas than there are in the rest of the world combined. Are they ordered out of the back of a magazine? I don't know if it's the back of a magazine, but I know they're getting them from somewhere. It's like, how do you get that connection? I guess. <laughs> well, now you can buy them from Texas. Yeah. Well, a lot of them get abandoned in Texas because people like to keep a tiger in their garage and don't do anything with it. So there's a lot of animal sanctuaries that take them in, which is kind of part of what they were trying to show with this film is like the, the nature preserve aspect and how to treat these animals better. But anyway, there's an amazing Life Magazine article on this line, which was named Neil. And it's basically just showing this household with a 400-pound male lion fully maned, acting like a house cat. Like, it, there's parts where people are just stepping over it as it lays in the middle of the floor. It's, like, cuddling up with Tippi Hedren as she reads a book. It's sitting next to the pool, like, playing with the people in the pool, grabbing at their legs when they walk by. It's basically just a giant 400-pound house cat. And there's even one picture at one point of Melanie Griffith riding it like a horse. That sounds cool. Yeah, that is pretty cool That's to what me. I would do if I was a kid <laughs> in a house with a lion that didn't try to eat me. And like any family that gets pets, you rarely stop at one. The family started ordering more cubs, including a pair of tiger cubs. When one of Marshall's sons pointed out that there weren't tigers where the film was supposed to be set, he said, I know, but they're just so cute. You know... I don't know where they go wrong, and all of these seem like amazing decisions. <laughs> and this is when are another... we going to get to the bad idea, Tony? <laughs> well, this might be considered one of them. There's a thing I want to get into. Tiger cubs out of the back of a magazine. Well, that's that's definitely a bad idea. But the weirdest, one of the weirder things about this movie is that it's a family starred movie as well. The entire cast, except for uh, Mativo and like the two animal handlers, is their family. Like, they just had their kids and themselves act in it. So, like, he's putting his stepdaughter, his three sons, and all these in complete harm's way because they know th how to handle themselves a little bit better around these lions. But, like, even before production starts, the injuries start popping up all over the place, and he's just fine with it. Although I will say that Noel Marshall, he took more damage than pretty much anybody else because he was consistently working with them and consistently the guy on screen like messing with these animals making sure that they were uh, acting the way he wanted to which is another fun point about this movie the animals were giving a director and writer credit in the in the credits of this film i okay the main reason for that is that most of this film is kind of improv based on what the lions are doing which is the main problem with the narrative because there's almost no narrative in this movie it's it could be best described as lions destroy house. That's like the plot of this movie. Like where they're just slowly dismantling everything because it's too many lions in a small container. I like the fact that this guy sets out to make a pro-conservation thing and shows this family working with lions. And in real life and the movie, the lions are just awful. <laughs> it's not their fault. Not at all. Like, you could definitely tell that he loves these lions, but it's it's a it's a thing. It really is. Also, at this point, the neighbors began to complain that there were too many giant predators next door. Noel Marshall would Wait, end... where is this happening? I, I want to say this was like Beverly Hills or something like that. Okay. It was definitely California. So this is not in the jungle at this point. No, no. This movie was entirely filmed, well, almost entirely, in Acton, California. So, like, it looks like it's Africa with the way they set it up, and they did some establishing shots and some other things in Africa. But this is almost entirely shot in California. Man, 45, 45 minutes to the hospital in Acton, California? It's a big state. Fair enough. And at this point, Noel Marshall would end up buying a ranch to house all of these cats. Which actually still stands today as the Shambhala Preserve, which is funded by the Roar Foundation. Like, they still have a website, they're still taking in big cats, and they're still doing good work. And if you go there, you can actually see some of the descendants of these big cats. They would use this preserve to take in cats that were mismanaged as pets, abandoned by drug lords, and pretty much any other way a person could mess up raising a giant 400-pound cat. They also ended up getting circus animals like elephants that would help add a bit more flavor to Roar. These guys... I uh, it's I understand it's well intentioned and it seems like the final product is great, 
It doesn't sound like the best actual way to. They're just sort of slapping stuff in there. Yeah, they like, really like, oh, are. Yeah, the elephants, and t- like tigers are in Africa, right? They put the tigers in there. <laughs> yeah, it was a little bit slap shot, and they were just kind of trying to do that. I think they were actually making fun of that a little bit because one of the handlers in the film is like, "We don't even know how you got tigers here." <laughs> okay. Sometimes hanging a lampshade on it is just pointing out your own stupidity. That yeah. doesn't really make it better. Sometimes. But also, like, uh, tigers are a lot more volatile than lions, generally, and they're a lot more solitary. So they, if this was 115, like, tigers, there probably would have been a lot more damage done than, than the damage that was already done here. I guess we dodged a bullet with that one? Yeah. <laughs> we dodged... So, a bullet to go into the other five that were being shot by the lions. This yeah. metaphor is breaking down, Tony. Continue. <laughs> it's okay. They also built the set for Roar at this location. It was a very sturdy house by set and Hollywood standards because if they were to build it like they usually do, the floor would literally start caving in. And I'm trying to give you guys a sense of scale for how many lions are here at one time. There's a sequence where he walks into the living room of this house, or kind of the foyer or whatever it would be, and there's at least 25 lions just in the room with him, all of which are excited to see him and immediately start pouncing on him and pushing him against the wall and start licking his face and grabbing his head and just, it's insane. Like, they had to literally reinforce the sets so that it wouldn't collapse under the weight of how many lions they shoved onto the scene. How much did you say one lion would weigh? Uh, generally about 400 pounds. Tigers can get up to 600. Uh, lionesses are going to be more like 300. Yeah, I could get up to 400. <laughs> Give me it's a fork a... and some ice cream. <laughs> it's like, we'll get there. We'll get that uh, that medical disability for being I'll huge. I'll be better than a lion at something. <laughs> at digesting dairy, probably. Yeah. They also built their production studio on this site to cut costs. Originally, it was estimated that the cost of the film would be around $3 million, but before filming even started, the ranch and other costs showed that this would be a far cry from enough. Also, the lions kept breeding while they tried to secure funding, so the costs kept going up from there. In 1970- Man, they didn't I, they didn't have the spay and neuter your pets thing at the time, or were they worried about doing that because they didn't want to run out of lions? I'm not entirely sure what the logic there was. I know that most of the time at animal preserves, they aren't going to neuter the lions because it makes it so that they don't grow a mane. So a lot of times they spay the lionesses. Maybe they just didn't have the funding to get out there and do that to like 70 lionesses. Or who knows, it could be any number of things. But they they might have also felt that that wasn't the natural way to do it. I couldn't find information on why they weren't spaying them. But it was... Everything else they've done is so logical, Tony. It's just this (laughs) one thing that doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, and And think uh... every new lion is like hundreds of pounds a week of meat that you have to buy. So it just keeps on getting more expensive. However, in 19- I didn't even think about the food. Yeah, that's a, that's actually what stops production a lot of times on this, is that they have the choice of either filming the movie or feeding the cats, and they always chose to feed the cats. Hey, in- it's not all that, I guess. Yeah. In 1973, however, Noel Marshall, some fortunate financial luck, when a movie he produced went huge. You might have heard of it. It's called The Exorcist. This helped with their financial woes, but all of the money was immediately funneled towards Roar. Yeah, the Exorcist, fine movie and stuff. There aren't no lions in it, though. Yeah, it could have definitely been improved with lions. It's like Pazuzu got nothing on lions. When production started, they hired Melanie Griffith's friend, who looked a lot like her and was uh, used to the lions because she was at that house. After about a quarter of the way through, Melanie Griffith decided she wanted to be part of the production again and kicked her friend out. She originally declined to be part of the production because she was worried, and I think the actual quote was, I think they'd claw half my face off. And then by the time they actually got to filming, she decided that she wanted to be part of it. Joel Marshall, one of Noel's sons, decided that he wanted to work on editing the movie and not be on set for this. Ironically, he was one of the first people injured on the set when a lion got curious about his shoes and tore one off. At least he got to keep the foot? Yeah, yeah, thankfully. Kenyan actor Carlo Mativo was also hired and would be the only actor in the entire film who wasn't severely injured. He said he would do anything required of him, but would not try to befriend the animals. In his country, you were taught to keep the people and the animals separate. Marshall wisely brought in a pair of animal handlers to help with the film. Just so you know, the rule of thumb when handling big cats is that there has to be two handlers on set per large animal. So whenever you hire two handlers for over 100 big cats, I think the math works out, right? 
<laughs> I do. I am trying to imagine this set with 300 people just sort of waiting just off frame, waiting for the director to yell cut and then like running in to deal with the eye. That, that would be an amazing thing to see. That might honestly also skeeve the lions out more. Like if all of a sudden like 300 people come running, trying to grab their collars and stuff, that would, yeah. that would be incredible to see. But also it might end with more blood than we got. And there's a lot of blood to come. During pre-production, another one of the major injuries happened. John Marshall got tackled by one of the lions, which proceeded to lay on him for a half hour, gnawing lightly on his skull. Many, many stitches later, he would be back on the film. So not trying to kill him, just sort of like, I've got you, and just kind of yeah, doing just, that thing cats do where they just sort of play with something? Yeah, and it's... They weren't really sure if he was uh, if the the cat wanted to kill him, but John at one point in this movie you can see him trying really hard to uh, get away from a cat in a boat like he's trying to paddle away, and this cat just keeps reaching over grabbing him by the chest and pulling him and the boat back to shore, and like the look of genuine terror on his face is real because that's the same cat that literally gnawed on his skull. I don't know if it matters that it's the same cat. Like it's like oh wait. This is a different lion than the one that gnawed on my skull. I'm fine. I don't think people normally process things that way. How old is this guy, by the way? So this is the director's son, John. I, I would say uh, he was probably, he looked about like 20, 25, somewhere in that range. Okay, so he's not a kid. No, like uh, when, uh, when Marshall and Hedron got married, they both, like he had three kids from his previous marriage. She had her kid. They were all decently aged. Also, keep in mind that whenever they started this, it was 1969. It's been five years since the script was done, and they finally just now have enough money to film. So this has been a slow-moving production, so the kids are getting older as all this happens. So after five years, the script was done, and they finally had enough money to film for a grand total of two days. These scenes were pretty vital, though, as it was some of the best big cat fighting big cat footage I've ever seen. Like, you saw these full-size lions getting really pissed off at each other and just going at it like I... Have you ever seen Grizzly Man, whenever the grizzlies are fighting each other? It's like that not. level of violence where they're just... Like, I've I've seen a little bit of nature documentaries, but the, the way they're fighting is just awesome. And it's also rare to see, like, a lion actually fighting a tiger and them getting real pissed off at each other. You mentioned that a lot of the crew got injured, but if they're having the cats fight each other, are they getting hurt? I uh, like there's there's injuries that happen, but it's not like I there's a difference between being hurt and being injured. And like in a lion pride, there's always going to be like some violence there where somebody's getting swatted, somebody's getting clawed. None of them I uh, got injured to the point where they needed surgery or anything like that. But there was a lot of like interaction between the cats, and sometimes they were agitated to fight against each other. There was a part where Noel Marshall was tackled by about nine lionesses. And it's just staggering, like, the ease at which they just launch him backwards and tackle him. Like, it's just startling. Is this startling. in the movie? Yes, this is in the movie. Like, this is one of the first times we see him on camera, and he just gets tackled by these lioness, like these lionesses. Also in this scene, he goes to stop the fight that's happening between two of these large male lions. And he's just slapping them around and, like, shoving them and, and hitting them. And then one of them turns and just clamps down on his hand, which is in the movie, and fully punctured through his hand. He didn't break character, he didn't stop, he didn't do anything. He just went on with the film and walked up to the house and it started wrapping up his hand. And that's the scene where you see, like, all the lines in the foyer and everything that I was talking about earlier. He just, like, rolled with the fact that he just got completely chomped on by this lion. Yeah, that's great and all, but did you hear about Leonardo DiCaprio not breaking character when he cut his hand and Django Unchained? <laughs> that's I some actually... real acting. One of the first times I ever heard of this movie was because of a video that was showing like where actors actually got hurt on set. It was right next to the the Django Unchained one. Yeah, the Django Unchained is probably the thumbnail because everybody knows about that one now. Yep, yep. <laughs> also, we talked about this a little bit earlier about how like the script was not the most flushed out thing. And this was because they knew they would never be able to get the lines to fully cooperate with what they wanted all the time. So they allowed a lot of room for impro improvising. They had a few story beats they wanted to cover. They basically wanted to make a Jaws type thing in some ways, but also make it family friendly in weird ways. <laughs> the movie didn't know what it was trying to be. I gotta say, I can respect the idea of, listen, we're not gonna get these lions to do exactly what we want to. Let's get in there and try to get the basic bones of a story. I, I think that's probably not as big of a problem as... 
we actually don't know what this movie is supposed to be. Yeah, definitely. I Like I said earlier, the Humane Society was on staff for all of this, so no lines were hurt during filming. Although apparently, what about the people? Yeah, why, that's why actually the Humane Society ever come and be like, whoa, whoa. I mean, Two humane. Lines. Yeah, it's in the title, human. It's interesting that they were able to get these lines to go where they wanted by using fire extinguishers and meat. And the Humane Society didn't care that occasionally they had to bust out these fire extinguishers to scare the lions. I mean, that's not hurting them. That's true. It's hurting them. Yeah, hurting. With the hospital so far away, the crew was literally risking life and limb. One of the worst injuries came whenever John Dubont, the cinematographer for this film, was basically hiding in a hole and he was covered by a tarp. Whenever he revealed himself from the tarp and, like, the camera made a weird noise, it was reeling back and something, it scared one of the lions who promptly came over and bit him by the head and dragged him out of the hole. Ugh. Basically, this lion scalped him. It took 120 stitches, but Dubont was ready to go less than a week later wanting to get back on set. He actually got kind of obsessed with this movie. Like, he, he was just a full-on trooper and wanted to see this thing all the way through. Also, he would later go on to direct Speed and Twister and a couple other movies, so it's not like he had a small career. Did he get the shot? Yes, he did get the shot. <laughs> so Is the... there footage of this guy having his scalp ripped off by a lion? Not that I could find, which oh, I... Oh, man. They were very careful with their camera placement because they always had five or six cameras going just in case they needed an angle because they didn't have as many takes, and they were very careful about hiding where the cameras were. I'm wondering if somebody did catch this and they just felt like it wasn't worth releasing that part because it would just be weird to have a cameraman pulled out of a hole, like, randomly, like, in this movie. Oh, I know that you wouldn't put it in the movie. I yeah, was but, just like, thinking... I didn't see it in, like, any sort of DVD special features. I, like, I bought, like, a used DVD of this a long time ago. They do have, like, a really nice Blu-ray release of it now, but I did not see if they had that. That particular okay. footage. It was at this point that many of the crew members quit and had to be replaced. They did oh, not have Jean Dubon's. Oh, I don't want to go bit by a lion. <laughs> they did not have Jean Dubon's resolve with this. Also, at this time, they were still trying to find more people to help fund it. And while taking a bath, Noel Marshall was bitten on the ear by a lion, almost took his ear off. He was so mad he jumped out of the tub naked and chased the lion from the house. While doing this, he ran directly past a set of Japanese investors who were set to invest, and then when they saw him, decided they were no longer interested. Okay. And at this point, they were having some real budgeting issues, and food costs kept stopping production. We talked about that a little bit earlier. And they didn't really have any other option. They had to keep all these animals fed, especially because if you want animals to cooperate, one of the only ways to really get that, like, get that cooperation is to overfeed them. Noel took most of the beating for this movie and was considered the alpha by the lions, which I always wonder how a human can establish themselves as an alpha to a cat that could literally kill them in less than three seconds if they really got a mind to. Like, how, how does... That's about the, the state of mind, man. Yeah, I guess. But it's... And also, he's the one that feeds them, so maybe they understand that a little bit. But it, it, it's just a strange thing to me that they allow him to, like, fully grab him by the mane and yank him around and, like, hit him and do all that sort of stuff. Like, he... Uh, at so many points, is just straight up being the alpha to these. And it's so funny seeing these cats adore him. Because so many of them do. Like, they just want to be close to him. They want to be cuddled. They want to be, like, just around Noel. He's like he's basically like the cat whisperer. At this point, also, Tippi Hedren had her leg broken, so the scream you hear whenever she's riding the elephant is very real. Because the elephant crushed it between its tusk and trunk. And uh. la later in the movie, she ended up needing 38 stitches because she was walking on a log and a lioness decided to just kind of pin her to the log and bite her neck. Just straight up 38 stitches for that one. A little bit before all this, they realized that they had a safe word set up for when things got bad, but Noel wasn't going to do anything about it. He promised the actors on the set that if they started screaming out his name, Noel that he would come in and intervene and stop filming, like, immediately. And whenever his stepdaughter was on set, like, one of the first days, she got tackled and pinned to the ground and had a cat pulling her hair. Like, it wasn't biting her head, it was just pulling on her hair. And you can hear her yelling what you think is no, 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 but she's actually screaming Noel, like, trying to get the scene to stop. He didn't stop it for his stepdaughter. Jeez. Yeah. 
Also, Melanie Griffith's original thoughts became a reality when one of the lions clawed her face, and she needed reconstructive surgery to correct this. How much of the length of production is just because they go for like two days of shooting and then somebody gets horrifically injured and they have to be in the hospital for a week? Noel had so many injuries that he actually got gangrene from them. Like, so he was out for little bits with stuff like that. (laughs) And because some of these scenes were improvised and people were honestly terrified of what was happening, like, the, the family basically comes into the house and they're trying to find where the dad is. And then all the cats just kind of come creeping in and start trapping them in different places, start coming through doors, start, uh, like, literally tearing their way through doors to get to these people. And, like, you'll see one of them hide in a locker, and this big cat just comes up and actually knocks the locker over and pins it face down so they're stuck. Another one gets scared whenever it corners them in the kitchen, and they hide in the fridge, completely, like, non-planned. But then all of a sudden, like, five cats are just surrounding the fridge trying to figure out what climbed inside of it. And it's just, it's such a weird, weird thing to see. Because there's so much discomfort. I've never seen more discomfort in a movie. And that includes movies like Saw and things like that from the actors. Like, this is just, they are not safe and they're not very happy about it. This wasn't one of those 1950s styles fridge where you could actually get latched inside, was it? It was. Like, uh, Are they, you serious? Yeah, because like, they're coming in they're like, you could have suffocated. It wasn't even like a plug-in fridge. It was just straight up like an icebox. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> Tony, I'm, I'm getting a little bit just like skeeved out hearing about this. <laughs> what? Well, at least somebody was filming it so they knew, but they did have to take quite a bit of time to get the lines out of the room to open the fridge. Is there a light at the end of the tunnel? Well, it's about to get worse. Uh, that's not what I asked. <laughs> In 1978, the biggest tragedy struck started raining and a dam burst down the road and completely destroyed the sanctuary. Sixteen lions got loose, and while the rest were recovered, three got put down by the local sheriff's department. This included Robbie, the Rhodesian lion, with the black mane that was their lion king and the focus of the film. So, when they say no animals were harmed in the making of this film, they only are talking about when the cameras are rolling. Yeah, like, because, I mean, you can't blame a sheriff's department for, like, doing that if there's literally the biggest lion on the entire sanctuary just running through a neighborhood. It sucks and it's awful, but I can understand the logic, especially in the 1970s when a sheriff's going to be more likely to do that than try to find a trank gun. Yeah. And also because they house the production materials on the set, tons of cameras, editing equipment, footage, and other equipment was completely ruined. 1.5 million feet of film was ruined in this. The entire place was in shambles, and it would cost $4 million to set things back to normal. Yowza. The family began to sell everything they had. Hedron sold all of her jewelry and the memorabilia from the Hitchcock movies that she had done. They sold all four of their properties and took money from their other businesses, and essentially went bankrupt trying to save the production. They also went bankrupt... This is... The, this is... Have you, you've heard of the sunk cost fallacy, Tony? Well, I think part of it is that they genuinely cared for these animals, too, and they didn't want the sanctuary to go away. It wasn't just the movie. Okay, I, that I can understand. But, like, the, the if you're on the set of this movie where you've almost died and a lot of other people have almost died because the lions are crazy, and then you're like, I'm going to bankrupt myself to continue making this thing, that's... That's unwise, I would say. But yes, yeah. I, I, under, I do understand the other considerations of you actually care about these animals and you want them to be safe. That that I can get behind, I guess. Yeah, and I mean, if you like, if you get the sanctuary back and you... I just keep wondering if there was like some insurance for all the like equipment and everything, but I couldn't find anything on that. I just know it was a terrible thing for that. After they got everything rebuilt in 1979, a brush fire was heading towards the ranch and Marshall went into action to save the cats. He was able to evacuate all of them, but took a very serious mauling from a cheetah. Filming was supposed to only take nine months and cost $3 million. It took five years of actual filming and $17 million. Some have said that this was the most expensive home movie ever made. I don't know if that's fair. If the guy's a producer, like, his whole movies are going to be a little bit more, you know, high quality. Yeah, I think it's mostly because it's just his family on film playing with lions most of the time. Yeah, that's inaccurate. I I, I can understand that criticism, I guess. Tippi Hedren would go on to say that this was incredibly stupid and will never be done again. 
And I feel that she's pretty much right about that. I don't think anybody's ever going to make a movie quite like this again. I don't think anybody's going to make a movie anything like this again. <laughs> they'll today Hollywood would look at a lion. What, a, what? No, you mean a we're CGI not have lion? A lion? We're going to make CG. <laughs> I mean, it, they you did know. have a real tiger in Mandy, so that was cool to see. Oh, did they? Yeah, I like he's that one yet. he's tripping, he's tripping hard, and then like an actual li- or an actual tiger just shows up. It's a good movie. It's a bad because movie, to but it's hear, a good movie. Th- hear some of this stuff. I think if it was just a tiger, right? Like I've seen Life of Pi. I guess the tigers are, are more difficult. If if it was a lion. In Life of Pi, maybe one lion could have actually been live on that boat and you wouldn't have had to spend however many millions of dollars to CG create him and then snub him at the Oscars and have the company go out of business. But, like, it's a, the other end of the extreme where you have 150 of them live on on set is, that's maybe too much. Yeah. One of my favorite things during this movie is whenever a boat starts sinking and there's just a couple tigers like sitting on it and they're just so casual about the boat sinking. They're acting like there's uh, possible crocodiles or hippos and things. They didn't have any hippos on set, thankfully. That seems like something they would have done. But hippos are like, nasty. Yeah, they are. They are. Mean. I mean, of all the bad animals that they've encountered, if I walked onto this set after knowing all this and then I would I would just be gone. Like I would rather deal with the tigers and the lions than the hippo. Yeah, there's a, there's a little more intelligence there and a little bit less maliciousness. My favorite part of this is watching these tigers just casually sit on a sinking boat, like just <laughs> waiting for it to sink and then going to the side like nothing happened. There was just something awesome about seeing how casual they were about it, about it and just rolling with the boat as it's tipping over. It was just fun. There are some so really just fun moments. they're waiting for it to go all the way under, and then I guess they're like, yeah, oh, then they're like, water. okay, well, tigers love water. Like that's oh, do a, they? Yeah, they actually really do love water. That's always been a thing. Like, My local aquarium even has tigers at the aquarium, and it's mostly a water thing because they like being in it so much. Okay. That sounds delightful, by the way. I want to go to that aquarium. Yeah, it's a fun one. If you come back to Denver, we'll go. At this point, they found out that they could not find a distributor for America because they wanted too much of a percentage of the money. They needed to offset the costs, and they couldn't just sign the rights over like these distributors were demanding. They also found that they had a bunch of lawsuits coming from their creditors that would not allow this to be released in America, so they had to put the film out on the international market. It did well in some countries, but they did not see much of a return on their investment. So they didn't even get to release it in America? Nope. Not at all. I mean, at the time especially, that was like the place where you made your money if you were going yeah, to release not like, a movie. Internet. It's not like modern China now where it's like floating all of the Transformers movies and things more than the American audiences are. This even was... then, you're so, like, even today, the larger percentage of American take goes to the company than international. It's more of a factor, but for them to just have to sell it off to... Other other countries, I don't know if they did it piecemeal. Like sometimes you'll sell the rights to distribution as a single lump, and then the people who bought the rights. I don't want to get into the film industry. <laughs> yeah, I don't know enough about it to be speak authoritatively, and what I do know is boring. Yeah. But I, it it seems like that really hurt them. Yeah, it definitely did. They they never really recovered from this. Tippi Edren and Noel Marshall would end up divorced shortly after all of this was done. Oh, it's unknown man. if Roar was the main cause of the divorce, but I'm guessing that that strain did not help. That kind of makes me sad, the fact that they made it through literal lions and tigers, and then when they were done, they're like, well, we don't like each other. <laughs> yeah, it, it is really sad. Or they, they were staying together for the cats. You know, it's always hard to break up whenever there are animals involved. It's like, who gets the dog? Who gets the 150 lions that we have in our house? Well, the answer to that is Tippi Hedren, and she would eventually start the nonprofit, the Roar Foundation that I talked about earlier, to help take care of the Shambhala Center. She still runs it, and people can donate today. Like, that is still a thing that's going on. She is still around. And this well, movie... I'm glad they kept their common vision for helping these cats, at least, even if they couldn't stay together. Yeah, she she did release a book on it, and she's done a lot of uh, promotional work uh, talking about these sorts of uh, things and preservation. And she's really spent a lot of her time with it. Even now, after that movie, you can still find her like all just sitting there with her tigers and panthers and all these other different things. So she genuinely loved the animals. Well, that's good. Almost makes up for the 70 people who got hurt. The, it's unfortunate at this point that the movie was basically forgotten. But 34 years later, in 2015... Roar got some fortunate luck. 
Tim League, the CEO of Alamo Drafthouse, overheard a conversation about Roar and how it was never released stateside. He originally thought it was too preposterous to be true, but after some digging, he located an international copy. He, along with the CEO of Drafthouse, decided that they had to show the world this film, and they fought to get the publication rights. They were able to you put know, interestingly finally... Interestingly enough, that's how I know about this, because the Alamo Drafthouse has a website that they run also called Birth Movies Death, and at the time, they did a huge push about Roar talking about where this film came from and that was sort of my first exposure to it as well. Yeah, and I'm I'm really grateful that like uh, Draft House Films was able to get this out there. They finally gave it a real release. It wasn't like every theater across America, but it was all the Alamo Draft Houses. They released the DVD and the Blu-ray. Uh, it, one of the first things you see is Draft House Films. Before I knew that it was like the actual Alamo Draft House, I thought that logo looks familiar. And I, I do like the new tagline that they added. It said, no animals were harmed in the making of this movie. 70 members of the cast and crew were. Yeah, Th- they should have sold it on that. I still am kind of confused about the, I guess, because they borrowed the money, if they released it in the U.S., the creditors would just take everything. Is that what sort of happened with why they couldn't release it in the U.S. originally? Yeah, that's a big part of it. And they also okay. didn't uh, know how to market it. I think one of the taglines that the company wanted to do, the distributing company, was like, a horrific family good time or something like that. Okay, yeah. Like, that's not a good tagline. Nope. No, I'm not a marketing expert, but I, I'm going to thumbs down that one. Yeah. Well, the making of this film was fraught with bad ideas, forgetting it seems like a worse one. It's such an odd, bad, but amazing film that really should be seen. I, I actually really would encourage people to go get this. I couldn't find it on a streaming thing. Like, uh, I had the DVD from before. But you can buy it on Amazon. It's an amazing thing. Apparently, it's also been uploaded to YouTube, but that's sort of nefarious. Like, I don't think anybody's, like, really supposed to be doing that. But you can check this movie out. You can see some awesome reviews of it online. Like, uh, you can see some of these clips. I actually just put out a five facts yesterday about this, so you can actually see some of the clips over, over on YouTube.com slash Human Echoes. So it's kind of a double thing for Roar this week, but I was so fascinated with the movie that I just wanted to put it out here because it definitely is a bad idea. Yep, and a fascinating story in my opinion. I, it's one of those things that could only happen, like it could barely happen at all, right? And yet it's, it's certainly of its time where, you know, there, there's no way to, to do this with special effects and these people just happen to have the resources and the insanity to put all these lions together. And I mean, I guess I'm glad that we got what we got, the, you know, despite the fact that it was very, very dangerous, at least nobody died. Yeah. Nobody died. And the, a lot of the people that were hurt, like still came back because they were enamored by it. Like the guy that got 120 stitches said that he just couldn't stop watching because they never acted the same. Like they never had their habits. They were just, Every cat was so individual, and they were so fun to watch. Though They were just, they were into it, and I like that. I think that's going to do it for this Bad Ideas episode, though, so thank you all for listening. Thank you for getting this far. If you enjoyed it, please check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash human echoes. This will get you access to our bonus podcast, where you get to hear a lot of off-topic stuff from all the Human Echoes people. Hope you guys have a great week. Also, if you like to hear Tony talking about movies, you should go over to youtube.com slash human echoes. We already mentioned it, but that's our YouTube channel where Tony has five facts and he does some other stuff with our other coworker, Komet, where they talk about films and it's some interesting stuff. Yep. Bye, everybody. Week.